ओम शांति 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 ओम स्थापकाय च धर्मस्य सर्वधर्मस्वरूपिने स्थापकाय च धर्मस्य सर्वधर्मस्वरूपिने अवतार वरिष्ठाय राम कृष्णा जे नम असतो मद्गमय तमसो मोदय मृत्यो Let us offer our salutations to Sri Ramakrishna, the embodiment of all religions, the Supreme God incarnate. Let us pray to Him to lead us from the unreal to the real, to lead us from the darkness of ignorance to the light of knowledge, to lead us from death to immortality today's gospel class i have chosen the subject o oh mind go to your own abode when swami vivekananda first visited sri ramakrishna at dakshineshwar Sri Ramakrishna asked him to sing a song and this was sung Manuchal Nijaniketane most beautiful song it has very high spiritual significance he sang in bengali its english version is given in the gospel of sri ramakrishna it says o oh mind go to your own abode here in the foreign land of earth why should you wander aimlessly on strangers guys these living beings round about and the five elements are strangers to you all of them nan nisivaron why do you thus forget yourself in love with strangers oh my mind why do you thus forget your own ascend the path of truth oh mind unflaggingly climb with love as the lamp to light your way keep your treasure of virtues carefully concealed during your journey for like two highwaymen greed and delusion wait to rob you of your wealth and keep beside you constantly as your guards to shelter you from harm calmness of mind and self control companionship with holy men will be for you a welcome rest house by the road there rest your weary limbs a while asking your way if anything along the path should frighten you then loudly utter the name of the lord for he is the ruler of that road even death must bow to him 
when Swamiji sang this song, Sri Ramakrishna was immensely pleased. And the sublime truth has been revealed in this beautiful song. Sublime truth. We are all wandering this world aimlessly, taking birth after birth, passing through all sorts of hardships and sufferings. We have not been able to have real peace and joy in life. because we have come far away from our true home. So we are feeling miserable. Home is very uh, much liked by all. In home you feel peace of mind, you can relax and you feel great joy in your true home. Like the image of father or mother, the concept of home, the feeling about home is very positive, rather inexpressible. Many sentiments are associated with it. We feel it, we may not express or elaborate on it, but it is in our hearts, the concept of home. Even when we have grown old, even when we are thousands of miles away from our home, that memory of home is within our hearts. You find that in literature, you find that in religious books, what in brief this idea of home is. It is associated with freedom and of security. It is a concept of identity and love and probably many other things which we cannot really express in words but which we carry with us as a deep feeling. People who by circumstances have to live in rented houses or apartments cherish the desire to have, a, to have someday a home of their own. In an apartment you can't find the same freedom as in a home of your own. You cannot find all the conveniences you require. There is an atmosphere that keeps you rather strained. Even if you are living in an expensive apartment with all the conveniences, one thing will be lacking. The sense of identity, which is so important in life. You can't feel a natural identity with that place, with those dwelling places, rooms, etc. You say, oh, it is not mine, it is not mine, it is somebody's home. So you dream of having a place where you can feel possession. This is my home. And then you feel freedom. Then there is the idea of security also. You are not sure when you may have to leave an apartment. One day the owner comes and tells you, Sir, I am sorry I have to raise your rent 25% next month. This might happen when you don't have a home of your own. So, a person may be changing rented dwellings every year from one house to another. He moves. Sometimes from one part of the city to another, he shifts. 
or one town to another. That means wandering. But when that person has a home of his own and he feels a kind of security, then freedom, love and joy come to his life. Now, this same concept of home can be projected to our spiritual life. This concept has been described in the song which I just said in the beginning, which was sung by Swami Vivekananda in front of Sri Ramakrishna. Just as when we wander from home to home and are restless, so too a stage comes in our life. We call it spiritual awakening. When shifting from one pattern of living to another, Pursuing one set of desires to another, facing one type of crisis to another, we feel baffled, we feel dejected and confused. Is there a real stability in life? We ask, is there a possession which we can't lose? Then the heart craves for a level of stability, a level of freedom, a level of unchanging love, a level of real possession. That's the true, the spiritual goal of man. When a man is eager to find the true goal of life, to raise his life from the commonplace to a level of stability and equilibrium, this longing comes. He feels himself as a wanderer from home to home, from point to point, from instability to instability. And he dreams of that level of life where there is unbroken peace. He seeks the eternal, which is God. Only in God can the sufferings of wandering be over. In the idea of karma and transmigration, man is pictured as a traveler from life to life. Transmigration or rebirth happens as a result of unfructified karma and unfulfilled desires. Whatever you do, good or bad, leaves a kind of resultant. That resultant is stored in your mind. Good karma gives you a permit for happiness, and bad karma, you know, in modern language, the policeman's ticket, suffering. Nobody can escape karma. That's the idea at the back of this theory of karma. Man is the builder of his own destiny. If there is an accumulation of bad karma, he suffers in many ways. He experiences various sorts of mental and physical sufferings. They are not arbitrary. They do not come out all of a sudden. They are the results of one's past deeds. And if a person is enjoying happiness in comfortable situations, in contrast to others, who are suffering in many ways, that also is not arbitrary. According to this law of karma, he earned that happiness by past good, day, good actions. Besides this unfulfilled karma, there is also desire. Every moment people are creating desires, I want this, I want that, and none of their desires disappears unless it is fulfilled. They are stored in the subconscious mind, so in our minds, both these things are stored, the results of our past actions and our unfulfilled desires. In Sanskrit, these are called karma and kama. Karma means the results of past actions and kama means desire. All the karmas and all the desires cannot be fulfilled in one life. Even when a person is dying, he will say, Oh, I wanted to do this, I wanted to have that, unfortunately, now I am dying, I could not fulfill all those desires. He grumbles. It is true, it is common knowledge. We cannot exhaust all the desires that we have, and all the time fresh desires are coming. You have moved into your house, then after one year you feel, Oh, it is possible to move into a better house. You do that. 
Remain quiet for some time, but again you want something better. In this way, man's desires are always multiplied. As a result, he has to be born again in order to finish his past karma and fulfill the desires which were not consummated in past lives. That is briefly the law of transmigration. Now, when a person becomes serious about himself, he thinks of this bondage of karma and kama, this vicious circle in which he is evolving. He is revolving in this vicious circle. The memories of the past vaguely touch his consciousness. It doesn't matter whether he remembers his past or not. Remembering is not even advisable because if you remember past lives, many unpleasant memories might come. So better that we don't remember our past lives. It's a blessing in disguise, really. But if he believes in this law of transmigration, he begins to feel, well, through many lives, how many lives, how many lives I do not know, I have passed, I have done actions, good and bad, and I have created desires. Now I have been ushered into this present life. And now I am creating new desires. I am suffering, I am enjoying both. Now what is this fun? What is this? He seriously asks himself and the answer is given by the sages. The sages say, well, this is life. The life you are facing. But this is not all there is to life. You as an individual, a man or a woman, with a body, with a mind, with feelings, with emotions, with desires, you are a player on the stage of this world. You are facing sometimes good things, sometimes bad things, sometimes pleasant things, sometimes crisis. You are sometimes crying, sometimes smiling. You are attached to certain things, you are disgusted with certain things. That is a play. This is the drama of life that is going on and it will go on over again, over again, over again. But this is not the entire story. The sages continue, if you can find God, then you will see that this, this will stop. This transmigration will stop. If you are really tired of this show, if you are really impatient of this play, there is a way to end it, and that is realization of God, discovery of your true nature, reaching your true abode, true home. Even now, even when you are suffering, there is another phase of your personality that you have forgotten. You are functioning on what is called your practical personality as an individual. But at the back of this individuality, there is another truth of yours, that is your spiritual nature, your soul, which is not affected by this game of life. It is the pure, the free, the divine in you. <laughs> you have to be your soul. In man's divine nature, there is no karma. That divine nature, the soul of man, shares the nature of God. It doesn't desire, it need not desire anything because it is ever fulfilled. Has God any desire? God is projecting endless phenomena on this universe. But has he any desire for anything? He is creating, supporting and also dissolving all these things, inconceivable wonders. Even a little of that keeps us spellbound. Look at a mountain, look at the ocean, look at a mighty river, look at a beautiful flower, look at the face of a sweet child, look at a storm, everything is wonder. And we say, oh, who created this? And if we are of a religious bent of mind, our hearts are at once filled with admiration and reverence for God the Creator. But God himself is completely unattached. He is above all these manifestations of nature. God is eternally in his own majesty, which is not bound by the laws of nature. 
He is not bound by time or space or causation. He doesn't want or need anything because everything is in him. So when a person discovers himself, his spiritual nature, he shares the truth of God. He feels, I don't need anything. God is with me and in God everything is there. Love is there, security is there, freedom is there, joy is there, peace is there. What else do I need? So, the sages say, who are the sages? The sage is a person who has discovered his spiritual nature, who has discovered the truth of this game of life, this traveling, this aimless wandering from life to life. He has withdrawn himself from this game and has found God. He has found his true self. So, for him, this analogy of home becomes very relevant. Each life can be compared to a temporary home. Just as when a person finds his own home, there is a feeling of security, identity, freedom and love, so too on the spiritual level. When a person has discovered his spiritual nature, when he has discovered the presence of God within him, there is a similar experience. There is a feeling of possession. Now, I have got something which is never going to leave me, an eternal treasure. Now I have found an object of love. Who can compensate for all emptiness? Who, who includes all loves? It's not that by loving God we are deprived of all other loves. <coughs> God is the highest fulfillment of all our little loves. A person who has the experience of God feels that this great love which is God is touching all his objects of love. This earth on which he is walking becomes a heaven to him. This house where he is living becomes a hundred times sweeter to him. These relations and friends whom he is loving become a hundred times more beloved because the love in him is nothing but the light of God. All love, he feels, is coming from God. So that, that is when really he feels, this is my true home. This is my true destination. For that he need not die because God's experience can descend to him even when he is living. So great spiritual teachers tell us that if you have seriously considered the ways of the world, you will see that this world is not your true home, it is a temporary shelter. Your true home is God. Where there is the ultimate security, the totality of all loves, the ultimate freedom and peace and contentment. So a spiritual seeker keeps this goal in his mind. Just as in our ordinary life, we long for a home, we dream of this home. In the same way, the spiritual seeker always dreams of his true home, namely God. And he carries on his life so that this home may be attained even in this life. In other words, as a spiritual seeker, you always have to remember that in whatever situation you have been placed, whatever you are doing, that is not your ultimate purpose. Your ultimate purpose is God realization. You have to install God within you. And the sages also say, don't think that this true home of yours, God, this divine nature of yours, is far away from you. It is very close, closer, closest to you, if you only open your eyes. If with faith and determination you try to find the truth. Lord Jesus Christ said, Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. The same proclamation we hear from the sages and saints of all religions. They say, God is within us. Our spiritual nature is within us. We have to knock. We have to knock at the closed door of our heart. Then we shall find that divine. Whatever way you approach the divine, doesn't matter. That divine is common to all religions. A Christian can find the divine in the Christian way. A Buddhist can find the divine in the Buddhist way. A Hindu can find the divine in his own way. It doesn't matter in which way you are seeking. But it is a fact that the divine is there. 
Vedanta tells us that you can approach the divine through two different techniques. One is called the technique of knowledge, the technique of rational inquiry, and the other is the technique of emotion, the technique of feeling and love. With the technique of feeling and love, we seek the divine through prayer, through contemplation, through faith. We do not inquire much. We stand on the faith. There is God in my heart. God is love. God is beauty. God is power. He is dearer, dearer to me than any other thing. <coughs> These ideas we borrow from the experience of saints and seers. When we read about the experiences of saints and sages, we find them expressed in these ways. God is not a fiction. He is not a poetical fancy. He is real, real, very real. It is He who is giving you the feeling of love, enabling you to love, enabling you to function in life. All the power, all the love, all the knowledge that you are craving are coming from God. God is the source of everything. So, the seeker tries to develop love for God. And it is not difficult because to practice love is a very well-known exercise in our life. We began practicing love from our very childhood. As soon as we opened our eyes, as a little baby we opened our eyes and we fell in love with space, with light, we fell in love with the dear face of mother, we fell in love later on with toys, with this and that. Life is a process of continuous loving. Everyone knows that. So love is not a very difficult practice. As we grow in life, we can love many things. Things that we did not love before, we learn to love. In the same way, we have to learn this new love, God. And what a wonderful object of love God is. That is the seeker's spiritual chore. Through love, he tries to find out that God is in his heart. The love that he has directed to many things. To objects, to family, to children, to grandchildren, to sports, to hobbies. All through his life has been divided and scattered in hundreds of directions. Now a spiritual seeker tries to direct that love to God. He need not think, I am exhausted. All my stock of love has been exhausted by loving so many things. That's not true because when a man begins to love God, his love grows more and more. There is no lack for supply. No lack of supply. It will be continuously supplied. Prayer and contemplation are important factors in the path of love. The devotee constantly prays. He doesn't care to know where God is living, in which heaven, etc. That faith is enough for him, that God is in his heart. He must respond. So he prays, Oh God, show me your dear face, be with me, never leave me. You are really my true home, my ultimate home. So I want to be with you. With all the sincerity of his heart, he opens his heart to God. In the seclusion of his home, he prays to God. Praying means opening your heart to God and asking God to fulfill your spiritual desire, the desire to touch him, to see his face, to feel his presence as much as possible. Sri Ramakrishna did experience by having the vision of the Divine Mother. He could touch, he could feel, he could see mother's, mother was breathing. So, Sri Ramakrishna saw the Divine Mother living. So he went to the ecstasy. He had the experience of the immense love. Even when we are busy, we have to feel the presence of God. Even when we are working, even when our senses are experiencing sense objects, sight, sound, smell, touch, etc. The sages tell us that it is possible to experience God. More and more, the spiritual speaker comes to feel the presence of God. In all situations of life, he says, my eternal companion is God. He is my father. He is my mother. He is my companion. He is my friend. It is he who is, who is manifest as this vast universe. The famous verse, you know, Tomeo Madhaka, Tomeo Pita. 
तुम्हें बन सका तुम्हें तुम्हें विद्या दृढ़ तुम्हें तुम्हें सर्व मदेव देव फेमस वर्स ऑल द वंडर्स ऑफ दिस यूनिवर्स ऑल दिस ब्यूटी ऑल द पावर दैट इज मैनिफेस्ट इन इट इट इज ही इन दिस वे हिज प्रेयर एंड कंटेशन गो ऑन नॉट फॉर वन डे एवरी डे by this practice of prayer and contemplation slowly things open up slowly this crust of ignorance this wall of ignorance breaks and god begins to show his face god begins to appear before him then this person feels now my wandering is over now i have come to my true home my beloved god nobody can argue with him now because it is his experience so long as your mind is on the theological level your faith is not grounded on a rock your faith can be shattered but you have experience of if you have experience of god nobody can disprove your experience if i have black hair nobody can say my hair is gray no i know my hair is black who can disprove it that's called experience some such experience has to come in our spiritual life if you are interested in religion if we are interested in discovering god in finding our true home we have to carry on this prayer this contemplation this thinking earnestly we have to reframe our mind we have to readjust our life our life as it is when it is estranged from god is in a grand life its ways are ignorant ways that is we do something we feel we are doing we see something at once we feel either attraction or repulsion our mind is swayed by passions by likes and dislikes by hate by greed a person who is seeking god has to change these ways he has to feel that god is the doer it is his glory that is manifest in this world it is he that is peeping through all eyes just as he is in me so he is in all beings the outlook on life has to be changed merely sitting for half an hour in prayer is not enough changing the outlook on life changing our old ignorant habits that's very important so that's why one who is called a bhakta a devotee of god who is seeking god through emotion through love through faith is very particular about his spiritual practices and it goes slowly god realization doesn't happen suddenly in one morning it is a process <clears throat> it happens from day to day every day one must keep on practicing then you will have the realization of the supreme godhead more and more this person begins to feel that god is within him and he identifies himself with his spiritual nature never even in a dream does he think i am so and so i am so and so whenever he thinks of i at once he relates that i to god in his deep subconscious this transformation of his ego happens his ego his i is individuality becomes connected always with god as soon as he says i he feels i am the child of god i am the servant of god i am the devotee of god in this way he grows in this way he becomes more and more god conscious he doesn't worry about the afterlife or death because when he has found god as his eternal companion he knows that god will never leave him in life that eternal companion is with me and when this body goes i will be with him so for him this traveling from home to home has ended he doesn't worry anymore he knows that if there is an afterlife if there is a heaven well and good but this is a fact god is there who will be with him i am god's child i am god's devotee my relation with god is eternal so he doesn't care for afterlife or heaven what will happen his emphasis is on his relation with god and that relation becomes stronger and stronger this person then even in this life has attained his true home that's why you feel you see that a real devotee is really very peaceful and happy and joyful 
even though he lives in this body really he is living in god he is living in his true home and in the true home god there is freedom there is peace there is tranquility and there is love this man by his god experience sees that he is surrounded by love and he transmits his love to all directions a man of god a person who has experienced god can never be cruel can never be callous because god's love is being manifested through him through his actions this is the way of finding our true home through the path of bhakti yoga or devotion and faith but vedanta says there is another technique the technique of self inquiry rational inquiry here the divine means the true home means man's ultimate truth his true self man is really resting on this infinite nature of his true self so this man's path is a path of inquiry he inquires into this world he doesn't say this world is a glory of god instead he says that this world is full of contradictions it is maya there cannot be eternal truth in this flux of life the eternal truth is at the back of this transient movement of life so he tries to see contradictions everywhere so much so that his mind becomes withdrawn from the ways of this world at least temporarily he has to negate all objective experience and find himself as the eternal subject so he dives deep to find the eternal within himself just as a diver goes to the bottom of the ocean he dives deep into his pure consciousness he practices being an observer he says oh body my beautiful body i am not you you are giving me shelter all right but i am not going to identify myself with you to the mind he says oh mind you are also a wonder but i am not going to identify myself with you because you are not eternal you are changing from moment to moment i want to find the eternal in this way he eliminates his body his mind his ego his technique is not through faith and prayer and contemplation and singing but through the rational approach eliminating that which is not self going deeper and deeper until he is standing on his true nature that nature is not in time space and causality the moment of life is outside that self eventually when he comes to his true home his true self he knows that all he had been seeing all these days this flux of life this play this maya was projected by the true self he sees everything in himself and then harmony comes when he no longer says this is flux i reject this the constructive process has begun first there was a destructive process this is maya this is maya i don't care for this it is changing it is changing that is the first part of his discipline but when he has succeeded in touching his true self then integration comes then he sees that what he had rejected is nothing but the self everything is consciousness everything is light matter space time mind thoughts whatever experience was there is really unbroken infinite that's called unity that's called non dualistic experience no more any duality whatever he sees and feels he knows in his heart that it is he there is only one reality that reality is, is his true self that is atman that infinite atman has projected everything no longer is he disturbed by this world in the beginning he had to be very austere he had to be very stern and uncompromising but when self knowledge has come there when self knowledge has come there is no more disturbance then he has found that everything is really the self that is atman this is called gyan yoga the yoga the communion through knowledge through self inquiry through analysis we can find that the sages of the upanishads tell us if you can find your true self your atman you find everything you find your true home just as through the path of love the true home is the god of love in the same way in this case the true home is man's infinite self and in man's true self the seeker finds the same experience that freedom that love that tranquility is also in his true self only his technique is different our teachers say the goal is the same when you are in your true home as the god of love really speaking it is the same as your true home 
which have attained to the path of knowledge, your true self. In either way, you have come to your true home. Once you have come to your true home, that is the end of your wandering from home to home. And when you have reached your true home, then you feel completely relaxed and in tremendous joy. If you take the life of Sri Ramakrishna, he was not only a great jnani, but, only, but also a great bhakta, a great devotee. So he has experienced ecstasy in both the ways. So love of God, he has reached the highest state of bliss. And through the path of knowledge, by practicing Vedanta, non-dualism, Sri Ramakrishna attained Nirvikalp Samadhi, where he experienced infinite joy. And then he concluded the joy that devotee gets by the realization of the truth is the same as the joy that one gets through Nirvikalp Samadhi. There is no difference in the joy, only different approach. And once you have reached that true home, you feel you are completely fulfilled and you enjoy that peace and bliss. If you see Ramana Maharshi's life, how peaceful and blissful after his spiritual sadhana and realization. He will be absorbed in silence. He will be absorbed himself in silence. Whoever comes near him would feel the influence of peace and happiness. And that is the glory of finding our true home. The Space Swamiji very aptly sang that song, Manachal Nijani Ketane, O Mind. Go to your true about. Why do you honestly wander about and make things miserable? We are responsible for making the things miserable. Because we are going in the wrong direction. So naturally we become miserable. If you have to experience real joy, if you have to overcome suffering, you have to come to your true home. Chapter 43, page 815, visit to, Naren, visit to Nanda Bose's house. It was Tuesday, July 28, 1885. It was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Sri Ramakrishna was sitting in Balram's drawing room with the devotees. Among others, Binode, Rakral, the younger Narain and M were present. The master had come to Balram's house in the morning and had taken his midday meal there. At Balram's house, the deity was worshipped as Jagannath, and the members of the family partook of the Lord of the, the family, members of the family partook of the food offered to the deity. Sri Ramakrishna used to say that the food at Balram's house was very pure. Narayan and certain other devotees had remarked to the master that Nanda Bose, an aristocrat of Bag Bazaar, had many pictures of gods and goddesses in his house. Hence, Sri Ramakrishna intended to pay a visit to Nanda's house in the afternoon. A Brahmin woman devoted to the master lived nearby. She often came to see him at Dakshineshwar. She was extremely sorrowful over the death of her only daughter and the master had agreed to go to her house. She had invited him with great earnestness. From her house the master was to go to the house of Ganu's mother, another devotee. The younger Narain had said to Sri Ramakrishna that he would not be able to visit him often on account of his having to prepare for his examinations. Master said to the younger Narin, I did not send for you today. 
The younger Narin said smilingly, What can be done about it now? Master said, Well, my child, I don't want to interfere with your studies. You may visit me when you have leisure. The master said these words as if he were piqued. He was ready to go to Nanda Bosu's house. A palanquin was brought for him and he got into it, repeating the name of God. He had put on a pair of black varnished slippers and a red border cloth. <coughs> As Sri Ramakrishna sat down in the palanquin, Yam put the slippers by his side. He accompanied the palanquin on foot. Paresh joined them. They entered the gate of Nanda's house crossed the spacious square and stopped in front of the building. The members of the family greeted the master. <coughs> he asked Yam to hand him the slippers and then got out of the palanquin and entered the large hall. It was a very spacious room. Pictures of gods and goddesses were hanging on all sides. Nanda Bose and his brother Pashupati saluted Sri Ramakrishna. The devotees of the master also arrived. Giri's brother Atul came and Prasanna's father, who was a frequent visitor at Nanda's house, was there. Prasanna was a devotee of the master. The master looked at the pictures. Him and a few other devotees stood around him. Pashupati was explaining the pictures to them. The first picture was of Vishnu with po The third picture was of Krishna standing with flute to his lips under the Kadamba tree. The fourth was of Vamana, the dwarf, who was an incarnation of Vishnu. The master looked intently at this picture. Next, the master looked at the picture of Dasimha, and then at one of Krishna with a herd of cows, with a herd of cows. Krishna was tending the cows with his uh, cowherd friends on the bank of the Jamuna at Vrindavan. Yam said, a lovely picture. We will stop here. Any questions to ask? So you are all wandering, dwelling in apartments, homes. So we can't be really happy as long as we are in the rented place. We must have our own place to live on. Then we feel great happiness. So when you realize God, then you feel the great happiness. That is the substance. Anything to ask? Chant the name of the Lord and His glory unceasingly. The mirror of the heart may be wiped clean and quench that mighty forest fire, worldly lust raging furiously within. All names stream down in moonlight on the lotus heart, opening its cup to knowledge of thyself. O self, drowned deep in the waves of his bliss, tasting his nectar at every step, bathing in his name that bought by weary souls. Various are thy names, O Lord, in each and every name thy power resides. No terms are set, no rites are needful for chanting of thy name. So vast is thy mercy, how huge then is my wretchedness, who find in this empty life and heart no devotion to thy, na thy name. O oh, my mind, be humbler than a blade of grass. Be patient and forbearing like a tree. Take no honor to thyself, give honor to all. Chant and see zingly the name of the Lord. O Lord and soul of the universe, mine is no prayer for wealth or retinue. The playthings of lust or the toys of fame. As many times as I may be reborn, grant me, O Lord, a steadfast love for thee. A drowning man in this world's fearful ocean is thy servant, O sweet one. In thy mercy consider him as dust beneath thy feet. Ah, how I long for the day when an instant separation from thee, O Lord, will be as a thousand years. And my heart burns away with its desire, and the world without thee is a heartless void. Prostrate at thy feet let me be in unwavering devotion, neither imploring the embrace of thine arms, nor bewailing the withdrawal of thy presence, though it tears my soul asunder. O thou who stillest the hearts of thy devotees, do with me what thou wilt, for thou art my heart's beloved, thou and thou alone. O Lord, lead us from the unreal to the real, lead us from darkness to light, and lead us from death to immortality. May all be free from dangers, may all realize what is good, may all be actuated by noble thoughts, may all rejoice everywhere. May all be happy, may all be free from disease, may all realize what is good, may none be subject to misery. 
May the wicked become virtuous, may the virtuous attain tranquility, may the tranquil be free from bonds, may the free make others free. May good be there all people, may the sovereign righteous dear rule the earth, may all beings ever attain what is good, may the worlds be prosperous and happy. May the clouds pour in in time, may the earth be blessed with crops, may all countries be freed from calamity, may all men live without fear. May the Lord the destroyer of sins, the presiding deity of all sacred works be satisfied, for he being pleased the whole universe becomes pleased, he being satisfied the whole universe feels satisfied. <laughs>